Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of fetal uh, health. So it's actually uh, different fetuses and we have a classification for their health condition at the end, which is uh, one for normal, two for suspect, and three for pathological. And we're gonna try to predict uh, the health of the fetus based on a bunch of um, continuous features. So everything is actually encoded already um, there are no categorical features in this data set. Um, and there are no missing values as well, as we'll see when we get into the notebook right here. Um, we're going to import NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. Then for visualization, we're going to do a little EDA. Uh, we'll use PyPlot and Seaborn. And for pre-processing, we'll use the train test split function and standard scaler from sklearn. Then we're going to train on a whole bunch of different models. Uh, we have logistic regression, k-nearest neighbors, decision tree, uh, two SVMs, support vector machines, uh, one with a linear kernel, one with a nonlinear kernel. And then we have a neural network and all of our ensemble methods. So we're using random forest, gradient boosting, XGBoost, LightGBM, and CatBoost. So uh, let's go ahead and import all of that and load in the data using pandas.readcsv. We can grab the CSV file path up here, fetalhealth.csv. Let's paste that in and take a look. All right, so uh, we have 22 columns. And if we take a look at the info for the data, with data.info, uh, you'll see we have no missing values either. We can further verify this with data.isna.sum and then .sum again. And that'll be the total number of missing values in the data set, which is zero. So we have all float data no categorical, no string data. Um, so most, pretty much all of the pre-processing has been done for us. Only thing we would like to do with this data is scale it. Um, so we standardize the columns so that they all take on the same range of values. But before we do that, let's do a little EDA. Exploratory data analysis. This will just be a, basics, a basic uh, EDA. I'm gonna create a, a, a copy of the data frame just for the EDA called EDADF. That comes from data.copy. And first thing I want to do is plot the distributions for each um, for each of the columns. So what we can do is for each, well, first we'll make a pie plot figure with plt.figure. Give it a figure size, that may be 25 by 15. Then for each column, but I'd also like to index the column. So I'm going to say for i and column in enumerate, uh, edadf.columns. So essentially for each column indexed by i, we'll create a new pie plot uh, subplot in a four by six grid. Uh, so four by six and indexed by i plus one. And the plus one is because it has to start at one instead of zero. Then we will give the title, uh, the, we'll give the plot a title. Uh, this will be just the column name. So column and we'll display the plot as a seaborn hist plot, which will be a histogram. We can turn on kernel density estimation if we like, uh, and we're gonna display that for, uh, the data will be EDADF sub column. All right, then we'll say uh, plt.show. If we run this, um, I think we will run into an issue where the labels might overlap yeah, you can see the labels are all overlapping. So a quick fix for this, you just type right before we show it, uh, plt.tightLayout, like that. Uh, and that should uh, adjust automatically adjust the spacing so that we don't have overlapping labels. Um, and for this, we can here see a histogram of every single column. Uh, there are only two in here, I believe, I believe this one. Um, this, this one has only two values, uh, but I'm, it's not meant to be interpreted as a categorical column. There's like one value over here, and then all the other values are here. But I'm pretty sure this is just a rare occurrence. It's not a categorical. Um, yeah, so you can see uh, most of the distributions, uh, well, some of them uh, look normally distributed, like this one. Um, but yeah, all right. Uh, there's not much more to look at there. Uh, we can also get some box plots, which are nice for um, handling outliers, uh, looking for outliers. So we'll grab that. 
I'll just copy it over. Only thing will change is change his plot to box plot. Um, and we should be able to get box plots for each uh, for each column. All right, and you can see um, not too many outliers. Again, this one doesn't really count because we this only has two values. All the values are here, and there's this one occurrence of that. Um, this maybe you could consider some of these outliers. I'm not going to do any outlier removal on this data. Just nice to look at. Uh, if you did want to, box plots would be really important. All right, then we could uh, maybe take a look at the correlation matrix. So I'll create a correlation matrix with data uh, edadf.core uh, and store that in core. And we'll create a new pie plot figure, a figure size of 24 by 20, since we have quite a few features. Uh, then we'll call seaborn.heatmap and pass in our core. Turn on annotations. Uh, we will set uh, no, we'll set the v min, which is the lowest color value that can be um, displayed, uh, to negative one, since that's the lowest value that the Pearson correlation coefficient can take. And we'll turn the color map uh, to blues. Yeah, I think that should be it. Actually, no, let's give it a Mako color map. Looks nicer. All right, and then we'll give it a title, which is confusion. No, uh, correlation matrix. And we'll show it. And here it is. Um, it's a little, it's a little big. Let me just zoom out a little so we can see it more nicely. Um, all right. So, yeah, we we, have, we do have some high correlations here. Uh, mainly these ones, which is that they seems to be the histogram features are highly correlated. Um, we have some highly negative correlation uh, high negative correlations here between the histogram min and the histogram width and then over here are some positive correlations between the histogram mode and the histogram median and this sort of makes sense uh, because they're all taken from the same distribution so the mean mode and median should be similar um, the width and the minimum uh, I can see how that might also have an effect uh, a correlation uh, I'm not going to drop any features since we are working with a relatively small number of features. There's no need to. Um, but yeah, that's so last thing I'd like to do is display the class distribution as a pie chart. So we'll again create a new pie plot figure with a figure size of 10 by 10. And we'll call a plot.py. So uh, we'll, we'll like to draw values for the pie chart from EDIDF. Uh, just the fetal health column, which is our class column, and dot value counts. Uh, so if we look at what that looks like, just that that value there, uh, you can see it's a class distribution. We have um, we have a one, a two, and three, and so the one actually it says over here one corresponds to uh, normal, two two to suspect, and three to pathological. So what I'd like to do is up here. Uh, right underneath data.info, I'm going to create a uh, all caps variable called class names. Uh, and this will be the actual text labels associated with 1, 2, and 3. So we'll have normal, suspect, and pathological. Alright. Um, and then Okay, so then, uh, you know what, maybe I won't do this, because I, I, I want to use this differently later, so I'm just going to leave that off. I'll just paste it in directly right here. Um, right, so we're going to just assume that we know, the for now, that 1 is normal, 2 is suspect, 3 is pathological. So in here, uh, we're going to include labels. That will be our class names. So this will tell it uh, in the order that it comes. And uh, the way that uh, it will plot them is in the order of value counts. So this is the order it will go. One, two, three. So we can pat match that up with normal, suspect, and pathological. All right, so if we give this a title, class distribution, and show that. Uh, looks a little bland. Let's uh, spice it up a little. Um, I want to include 
auto percent, uh, which allows us to get the percentages uh, in the in the uh, pie chart spots. Um, we'll format that with two. We'll display percentages to two decimal places and a percent sign after. And I'll also I'll give it a color map uh, colors that we'll use a seaborn palette here sns dot color palette. Um, we'll use the grays color palette. And so you can see the class distribution. Uh, we do have mostly normal and then a few suspect and even fewer pathological. So you could say there's a bit of a class imbalance here. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, let's go let's move on to pre-processing. And for pre-processing, we really don't have to do much. Like I said, all we're going to do is scale the data. Um, so I would actually like to use these labels as the names for the values in the target column. So I'm going to create a function called preprocess inputs. It's going to take in a data frame. It's going to create a copy of the data frame, and then it will return the data frame. So this is just going to allow us to modify a fresh copy each time, so that we don't we can keep a copy of the original data. So I'm going to pass in our original data, get back x, and we can see the copy we've modified down here. Currently, it's just the same. Um, so let's make uh, make the target make the type of the target categorical. Let's actually, let's say, uh, rename target columns, uh, target values. Um, so we're going to take the fetal health column, which is the target column, and call dot replace on it. And replace allows us to pass in a dictionary with the mapping we'd like. So we're going to map one, which it is in float form, to normal. Two will be mapped uh, to suspect and three uh, will be mapped to pathological. All right, and then let's store that in the original column, like that. Then we will split uh, the data frame into X and Y. Uh, y will be our target column, so that's just the fetal health column. And X is all the rest of the data, so we'll drop fetal health. And then we'll do our train test split. Uh, this will give, well, we can send 70% of the data to the train set, the other 30% to the test set. And we'll use the train test split function from sklearn. We pass in X and Y, specify a train size, like I said, 70% for the train set. Uh, include shuffle equals true. This is on by default, but we just want to, um, because we're shuffling, we're going to include a random state. Um, which will ensure that the shuffle and the split are always done in the same way when we go to reproduce the results of this notebook. And that will return four new sets of the data. X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. So we've split in two directions like this, and now let's return those values uh, and take a look at X train. Uh, so this is 70% of the data, and it no longer has the, the target column at the end. Let me zoom this up again. Um, yeah, and so Y train should have our target values, and they are as uh, we've mapped them, so normal suspect and pathological. And now we'll, we'll scale. So, like I said, we want the um, we want each of the columns to take a similar range of values. So there's a few ways to do that. Uh, we will use a standard scalar, and the standard scalar will give each column a mean of zero and a variance of one by performing a shift in the scale to each column's distribution. We can fit the scalar just to the train set because we sort of we want to pretend we don't have access to the test set when we're doing the pre-processing. And then we're going to transform both the train and test set using scalar.transform. Um, however, this does return a NumPy array. So if I see this, uh, the data has been scaled. But we can't view it nicely like a data frame. So let's go and turn it back into a data frame. And I'm going to keep the indexes, uh, the indices, the same as they were, and the columns the same, the column names is the same as they were. And we'll just copy this over now and change all the X trains to X test. So we are fitting only to the train set, but but uh, transforming both the train and test set using that fit. Um, and now we have scaled data. So if we look at 
uh, xtrain dot describe. Um, you'll see the means are all very close to zero and the variances or the standard deviations are all very close to one. Um, all right, and now we can train. So we're gonna use a whole bunch of models uh, the, the, like I showed earlier. I'll just paste in this dictionary that maps the name of the model to the actual instance of the model. Um, and these down here are just to avoid uh, errors that were coming from these uh, XGBoost and CapBoost. Uh, the reason we do it in this dictionary way is because now we can say for name and model in models.items. And dot items will return the key value pairs as tuples, which we can iterate through two at a time like this. Uh, for each pair, we'll fit the model to the train set and we'll print out a confirmation message with the name and just saying that the model is trained. And you can see uh, as each model trains, we get a message. And when that's done, we'll display the results. Um, and the, so they're all finished training and to display the results is just as easy. We say for name and model in models.items, print name and uh, let's display the, the accuracy value for a given model to two decimal places as a percentage and format that with model.score. So model.score, if it's a classification model, will return the accuracy value evaluated on whichever test set you pass in. So we'll pass in x test, y test, uh, and take a look. Oh, and I actually should multiply this by 100 since it's a percentage. All right, and uh, it seems like all of our models are doing quite well. Um, the worst performing model was the linear SVM with an 88%, but that's still not bad. Um, now, I would like to say the accuracy value is a little misleading when dealing with uh, class imbalance. Um, but when compared, when comparing models to each other, it's an, it's still a nice way to gauge their relative performance. Um, and then it looks like Cadenor's neighbor is a little higher. And then about around 90 is where all the models are lying. Uh, logistic regression, then our decision tree and radial basis function kernel uh, SVM. Then on top of that is the neural network, then random forest. And it looks like all of our boosting methods are taking the cake here with 94% or above. Um, yeah, and so that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.